Today we commemorate World Humanitarian Day and we remind the world that we are caught in a climate emergency. The last six years have been the hottest on record and the number of tropical cyclones globally was above average in 2020. And we particularly know this impact in the Philippines. We are confronted to a number of paradoxes that have to be addressed and very soon. On one side, we have all the evidence that we are doing something wrong with our planet, but the pace of our actions to revert the situation is still very, very slow. And young people are pushing their elders to do what is right. Another paradox is that those that have contributed least to the global climate emergency, they are, however, the most affected by this climate emergency. Millions of people are already losing their homes, their livelihoods and their lives. And you know that the Philippines is ranked the second most at risk country in terms of potential impact of climate change. Half of the most destructive storms on the planet since 2000, they have hit the Philippines. More than 1,000 lives are lost every year with typhoons and other tropical weather shocks accounting for 74% of the fatalities 62% of the total damages, and 70% of agricultural damage. So we need a green planet, but the world is on red alert. And understanding gender disparities and the special needs of persons with disabilities is crucial in climate change mitigations and adaptation, as well as considering how extreme weather events threaten children's lives. So, Today's World Humanitarian Day highlights the immediate human cost of the climate crisis to compel world leaders at the UN Climate Change Conference in November to take meaningful climate action for the world's most vulnerable people. This year, the Philippines will be hosting the world's first anticipatory action pilot for cyclones with the support of the UN Central Emergency Response Facility. Thanks to this investment, we will be working very closely with the government of the Philippines, development partners, the humanitarian community, and the private sector in developing anticipatory action to better respond to natural disasters. And we are proud of such opportunity, which is part of the race against the climate crisis, where we cannot leave anyone behind. And you have the opportunity to be part of the human race. And now, just join us. Maraming salamat, uh, Gustavo Gonzalez. Now, the climate emergency is wreaking havoc across the world at a scale that is unimaginable. Time is already running out for millions of the most vulnerable people, including the forcibly displaced populations around the world. Millions of people are already losing their homes, their livelihoods, and their lives. This World Humanitarian Day, we aim to highlight the immediate human cost of the climate crisis to compel world leaders at the UN Climate Change Conference in November to take meaningful climate action for the world's most vulnerable. With all our esteemed panelists joining us today, we will share how humanitarian assistance could be greener and how we can mitigate the impact of climate change. We will also illustrate how preparedness, mitigation, and adaptation actions can make a difference. And lastly, we want to show how the Philippines addresses specific vulnerabilities through integrated climate and disaster risk governance. Today's forum will be divided into two parts. First, we will have a turbo talk where six organizations will present their work in the race against the climate crisis. The presentations will be followed by a Q&A session. And the second part is a key stakeholder roundtable on sectoral perspectives on climate emergencies between five UN agencies, international NGOs, and the private sector. The roundtable will again be followed by a Q&A discussion. Now, please watch this short video for more details about the forum agenda. Welcome. 
This event has a sign language interpretation. Panelists are requested to be able to speak loudly and slowly and to raise their hands to speak. The forum will be streamed via you and Ocha Philippines and the Philipp and the PDRF Facebook pages. We invite you to introduce yourselves and build networks on the Padlet. During the forum, we will be we will have a series of presentations and videos, so we recommend using computer throughout the event. Here are some important recommendations. Microphones and chat will not be available, but as we want to hear your feedback during the forum, we will be sliding. We will be using Slido for all Q&A segments for this purpose. For access, we recommend using browser on your phone by going to slido.com and entering the lowercase code WHD1908. We will be we will also be sharing this and other important information in the chat. Log in now and post your question at any time during the session. You can also use the chat to chat with other attendees or if you have a, spe a, a special guest request. Please note that questions to presenters will be will only be taken in Slido. Finally, please note that the forum will be recorded. Thank you very much for being with us. We hope you enjoy today's evening and that it will be an excellent experience. All right. Now for today's Turbo Talk, we are privileged to have six organizations who are all doing their parts to help mitigate the impact of climate change. Participants can send in their questions by Slido while the presentations are ongoing. Now we will begin with Start Network. Allow me to welcome Ms. Jessica Dator Bercilia, member of the faculty, University of the Philippines in the Visayas College of Fisheries IFPDS. Good afternoon, this is Jessica, and I'm happy to be with you. Hello, my name is Jessica Dator Brasilia from the University of the Philippines in the Visayas and an advocate of climate and disaster resilience. I'm part of Forewarn, a collaborative platform on evidence-based anticipatory action involving the academe, scientists, and subject matter experts established by START Network members. START Network is made up of more than 58 agencies across five continents with the aim of transforming humanitarian action through innovation, fast funding, early action, and localization. The most recent assessment report from the IPCC affirms that anthropogenic climate change will influence natural climate variability and intensify climate extremes in the current context as well as in the near and mid future. This challenges an archipelagic country like the Philippines, which stands at risk to climate hazards. Foresight and innovation will be required to proactively manage climate change related disaster risks and avert future loss and damage. But how do we do this? Will five C's come to into mind? The first C is the commitment and support to anticipatory action as a form of incremental adaptation. This is imperative if we are to avert losses and damages in the face of current and future climate extremes. START financing facility is an example of an investment mechanism for evidence-based and community-centered anticipatory action that raises awareness on risks, invests in the reduction of vulnerabilities and exposures to climate and disaster-related hazards. Initiatives such as these must be supported 
by climate finance mechanisms like the GCF, as well as national and local funding mechanisms for climate change. We also need to bring to life the second C, which is climate justice. In the spirit of common but differentiated responsibilities, we call on those responsible for historical emissions that heavily impact on exposed and vulnerable countries to provide not just climate financing, but climate risk financing that reduces probabilities of climate emergencies. We also hold developing countries accountable to their commitment to climate action in the light of current greenhouse gas emissions, which they need to mitigate, and in the light of their obligation to protect the lives and assets of their citizens from climate emergencies. All these must be consistent with climate justice that does not sacrifice the lives, rights to life, livelihoods, communities, and ecosystems. A manifestation of the sense of climate justice is the third C, which is commitment to community voices and agencies. Inclusive risk analysis, risk communication, disaster preparedness, and incremental adaptation for near-term climate stressors and drivers of disaster risk will be necessary. Enabling agency in communities at risk has the power to influence transformational adaptation and mitigation in support of sustainable development goals. Moreover, facilitating enabling environments and conditions for such agency to surface is vital to the reduction of climate and disaster risk. Empowerment of communities has a long, been a long-standing commitment of start network in climate and humanitarian action. We are all witnesses to the role of the fourth C, civil society, in transformative processes. Governments and other stakeholders must recognize, acknowledge, and give legitimate spaces for full and meaningful participation, as well as support for civil society so that they can continue to contribute significantly in the work of reducing root causes of vulnerabilities that enhance climate and disaster risks. Finally, together we must break the divide between humanitarian and climate action. We need to work towards the fifth C, co-beneficial approaches that reduce climate change and disaster-related hazards, exposures, and vulnerabilities. In this World Humanitarian Day, we call for five Cs for the meaningful climate and humanitarian action, climate justice with a commitment to anticipatory action, agency in communities, civil society support, and co-beneficial approaches for climate and disaster resilience. Start Network, along with Forewarn, stands with you and humanity in our common quest not only to survive, but thrive along the paths of sustainable development. Ayun. Maraming salamat, Ms. Jessica, for showing us how to promote participatory and meaningful climate action. Our next speaker is the chairman of the Metro Manila Development Authority, or MMDA, Mr. Benjamin Abalos Jr. Now, he recorded this message for all of us. Hi, I'm Benjamin Abalos Jr., the chairman of the Metropolitan Manila Development Authority. Some of our mandates are, of course, urban planning, garbage, flooding, etc. But these are some of our projects that uh, is in answer to the grave effects of climate change. Number one is, of course, this Metropolitan Bicycle Network. We have developed this together with the Department of Transportation and Public Works. It's having a bicycle network all over Metro Manila. And this is a bus as a carousel. It's in the main highway of Metro Manila, limiting the buses to just one lane on the leftmost portion so that they will just only stop at certain, at certain areas. This will save time, space, and gasoline to the commuters. And of course, we have also explored the river mobility. Uh, these are some of the ferry service that we have had, and we've got some more boats that uh, were even expanding the routes to different provinces outside of Metro Manila. And a perennial problem are the water hyacinths. There are many of them. 
but we have developed technology to convert, to convert them into charcoal briquettes. This one could be sold and we're transferring this technology to several communities living within the river. And there is this project which is called Build Back Better. We're going to build back better the riverways of Metro Manila. This is actually the project of the, uh, the uh, Department of Environment and Natural Resources. We are helping them in several of these projects, one of which is in Marikina River, making sure that the width will be widened and the depth will be deeper. And aside from this, uh, there is this sewage treatment plant in Manila Bay. Uh, this is also with DNR, and we're also helping them to make sure that water that will flow out of, uh, of uh, Manila to Manila Bay will be filtered and clean. And aside from this will be this uh, walk, uh, in EDSA, this main highway, there is this overpass. We've cleared this, we're going to place pocket parks here, and aside from that, our sanitary landfill, before it was full of garbage, now it will be a park, a beautiful park with so many trees. And aside from that, in all 17 cities of, of uh, Metro Manila and municipality, we're going to get the most blighted area and convert them into pocket parks. And these are now the easement along the Pasig River, one of the main water artery here. And what we're going to do is create this easement, connect them all together, and, and have bike lanes. Manila River cleanup, of course, this is the scene after every typhoon made up of garbage, and we must really do something about this. What are the things that we're doing? Number one, we're clearing it by pushing train trash traps. We're the one who invented this just about a month ago. We are going to place them in all esteros, canals, and river, have people get this garbage. And Metro Manila right now has about 273 waterways, made up of about 700 kilometers of uh, uh, natural waterways and about 1,000 kilometers of uh, man-made waterways. So from the garbage that we got, we're going to convert them, some of them into compost. Others are into solid waste granulators like brick making facilities, uh, some of the garbage will be there, and others. But this is the ultimate solution, the last slide. What is this about? This is about a mobile materials recovery facility. What does it mean? It means that every household will have a notebook where they will, could earn points. They could surrender their garbage, it could be light materials, and for every garbage that they surrender, they will have points. And once they receive a certain points, they could now choose from whatever kind of goods they would like to get. And this proved to be successful in two cities in Metro Manila. We are going to transfer this technology to each local government unit in Metro Manila. These are some just of the projects against the dire effects of climate change that we are undertaking in MMDA. Thank you. Maraming salamat. Thank you so much, Chairman Abalos. Now, allow me to now give the floor to Ms. Pauline Caspelian, the Disaster Law Advisor for Southeast Asia under the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, or IFRC, Disaster Law Program. Ms. Pauline? Thank you, Atom. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I am happy to present to you IFRC's new report entitled Addressing Specific Vulnerabilities Through Integrated Climate and Disaster Risk Governance, Lessons from the Philippines, written by Dr. Tomaso Natoli, lecturer at the University College Cork. Climate and weather-related disasters are causing massive humanitarian impacts across the world. The Philippines is the fourth most affected country spanning from 1998 to 2018 in terms of climate risk. In December 2019, cyclones Kamuri and Fanfon affected 1.9 million and 3.2 million people respectively in the country. Our research found that intensified storm surges are predicted to affect more than 40% of the coastal population living in settlements in the Philippines. Population growth, rapid and unregulated urbanization, and informal settlements 
have also increased the Philippines' exposure to climate-related disaster risk. Moreover, unsustainable development has increased climate risk and has compounded vulnerabilities, especially with respect to the poorest sectors of Philippine society. The Philippines has a relatively advanced legal framework on disaster risk management and climate change. These are the Climate Change Act of 2009, its amendment that created the People's Survival Fund, and the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Act of 2010. But the law is not enough. We have to take the next important step, which is to strengthen their integrated implementation where it matters the most, at the level of the community. Our report recommends that laws and policies on climate change adaptation and disaster risk management should incorporate their resilient standards within each other's governance mechanisms without necessarily needing to abolish dedicated institutions for DRR or climate change. What's important is to have cohesive monitoring and reporting mechanisms between these two sectors from the topmost level of governance down to the level of the barangay. Lastly, both government and non-government humanitarian actors need to focus our allocation of resources to the most at-risk communities and local humanitarian actors on the ground. While communities at risk vary widely from place to place, informal settlers, displaced persons, indigenous communities, coastal and agricultural workers relying on environmental services for their livelihood, and the urban poor are the ones who are mostly underrepresented in decision-making around this climate emergency. This means that they are also frequently left behind in terms of climate and DRR plans. Our laws on climate resilience already mandate the participation of vulnerable groups, but this mandate will only become meaningful if they are actively included in local monitoring and evaluation processes to find out whether DRR and climate change programs are truly helping them become more resilient. Beyond legally mandating the collection of disaggregated data, the national and local government, the Red Cross, and other humanitarian actors such as the United Nations must ensure that these data are analyzed effectively and translated into action so that the differentiated needs of at risk people are effectively addressed by local climate resilience plans. Lastly, we have to make sure that local and indigenous knowledge on climate resilience are actively listened to and not taken for granted. We at IFRC have a clear mandate to focus on the most at-risk people and to ensure that they participate in decision-making. This is the humanitarian imperative of climate resilience, and we will continue to support this through the Philippine Red Cross and our partner communities. For more information on, on our disaster risk reduction and climate change report, we, are, we hope that you will visit the IFRC disaster law website that I have shared in the Padlet. Thank you all for your time, and may we have a meaningful conversation during this World Humanitarian Day. Maraming salamat, Pauline. Now at this point, let's talk about how climate change affects people with disabilities. Let's all welcome Ms. Marie Catherine Mabut, the Country Director of Humanity and Inclusion, Philippines and Indonesia. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to to share this presentation today, where we have tried to underline the abilities of people with disability to meaningfully participate to climate resilience. I wish you a good viewing of this video. Good afternoon. Let's start this presentation on the relation between climate change and disability. First of all, with Humanity and Inclusion, HI is an international humanitarian organization working alongside people with disability and vulnerable groups. HI has been active in the Philippines since 1985. Men, women, boys and girls with disability are more likely to be adversely affected by disaster and face numerous barriers to strengthening their resilience. They should not be considered as an homogeneous group and their climate vulnerability and adaptive capacity depend on a variety of individual and contextual factors. Direct impact of climate change range from higher mortality rate during and after disasters, 
being more likely to be left behind during evacuation, being less able to escape from hazard or to lose essential medications or assistive devices. People with disability may also have difficulties accessing basic needs. According to the studies, climate change is likely to increase disability prevalence, including through serious disease as a result of disaster, air pollution, food insecurity and malnutrition, as well as the psychosocial impact of warming climate. Our primary action to reduce the impact of climate change on the most vulnerable population is to support inclusive disaster risk reduction and management programming worldwide. HI Philippines has a strong expertise under this topic. Let me share with you some examples of best practices from present and past experiences. The Everybody Ready Manual is a collective effort of a technical working group composed by organizations with complementary expertise. It details how community-based DORM CCAM can be inclusive. The manual has been approved and endorsed by the Office of Civil Defense. The Inclusive Child Center DOR project had very interesting achievement on the development of inclusive and accessible IOC material that could be used not only in the Philippines. Also, the project has empowered more than 100 champions who are children with and without disabilities who directly led the implementation of activities. Then, the project promoted the use of a child functioning questionnaire, which is a child friendly version of the Washington Go questions. This led to the development of a policy under the Ministry of Education. As a result, today, all public schools use the child functioning questions. Another good example of participation and inclusion is coming from the Strengthening Urban Preparedness Through Preventive Action Project. It is a survey on the protection needs of the most vulnerable groups, children, women, people with disabilities, before and during disaster. Under the Empower project, we are going to implement community resilience adaptation and mitigation projects. They are built through a process of empowering actors to share the responsibility to keep us out from becoming disasters. Twin track approach is also essential to reduce the impact of climate change on the most vulnerable population. The participation is interrelated with the capacities at two levels. On one hand, at the level of NGOs, INGOs, authorities and donors, to include people with disabilities through partnership with disability-focused NGOs and organization of people with disabilities. On the second hand, at the level of representative organization of people with disability and the disability sector to carry out disability-specific action to strengthen their resilience. It is also essential to note critics on the document discourse focusing on disability and vulnerability. It overlooks their knowledge, skills and resources for dealing with hazards and disasters. Their experience of overcoming barriers and negotiating difficult physical environment make them better equipped to cope psychologically in a crisis than non-disabled counterparts. Inclusive disaster risk reduction management programming means focusing on active resilience building of people with disability rather than assuming passivity and vulnerability. Then let's be inclusive. Thank you so much, Ms. Mabrut. We will now hear from Institute for Climate and Sustainable Cities, represented by Ms. Danica Marie Suknet, who will share about climate responsive humanitarian initiatives and long term development planning. Thank you very much, Adam. Um, to start with my presentation, I would like to share a statement that uh, humanitarian action means a balance between practical approaches and long-term climate development planning. And we in the Institute for Climate and Sustainable Cities, um, next slide please, um, we strive for the balance through fair climate policy and low carbon development at all levels. Um, next slide please, uh, particularly the local level, our renewable energy initiative centered on integrating RE in disaster response to address energy access and use related issues. Next slide, please. 
the Solar Scholar, and the Solar Tech Packs, where our flagship are e-technology transfer initiatives in Tacloban City, um, years after the onset of Typhoon Yolanda. The Reserve Corps were trained to develop and enhance the tech packs and deployed in several response initiatives. For instance, next slide please. Um, 2018, during Typhoon Ampong in Cagayan. 2019, Typhoon Ursula in Tacloban City. Um, next slide please. There. Um, next slide please, also 2019, Typhoon Ursula in small island communities um, in Giwan Eastern Summer. And next slide, please. Also last year, um, 2020, Typhoon Ulysses in communities in Southern Sierra Madre. And the Reserve Corps um, will surely grow its family and remain active in humanitarian response. Uh, next slide, please. To support these practical approaches, um, the Climate Change Adaptation Framework, a science and evidence-based planning initiative, which was piloted in the municipality of Tiwan in 2017. We all know that Giwan was the first municipality where Typhoon Yolanda made landfall. The CCAP and the establishment of the Giwan Recovery and Sustainable Development Group for Resilience, or GRSDGR, was their biggest move from recovery towards long-term resiliency. Next slide, please. The GRSDGR, with active, active members from the local government offices, barangay representatives, Academe and Civil Society is the policy body for climate change under the office of the municipal mayor. And through their experiences, the Giwanons can attest that the locally driven climate action, both in policy and practical approaches, is the only way to go. Next slide, please. So this year, Giwan is now on its second review of their CCAP. And there is a great focus on the impacts of rapid onset events, such as tropical cyclones accompanied by possible storm surges, and slow onset events, such as sea level rise, ocean acidification, and sea surface temperature in small island and coastal communities, which greatly affected their water resources, livelihood, and lifeline infrastructures, adding gender, health, including sexual reproductive health and rights, and renewable energy and their adaptation and mitigation strategies. Next slide, please. And these municipal level initiatives are mirrored at the barangay level through responsive barangay development plan. Next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. Lastly, overall, uh, the common among these initiatives are first, the integration of science and evidence in both approaches, and second, a strong multi-stakeholder collaboration that ensures the initiatives are implemented and sustained. Surely there are more things to do, especially in humanitarian and climate um, governance, but then we can always start with working with the communities. Thank you very much. Maraming salamat, Ms. Supnet. Now, lastly, Let's now watch this video from the United Nations Population Fund on the impact of these humanitarian crises on women and girls.
right, thank you so much. Uh, and to all of our speakers for staying true to our Turbo Talk uh, format and for sharing your good practices, challenges, and lessons learned from your work in the race against the climate crisis. Now it's time to answer some questions from our participants and we shall flash them on our screen right about now. Um, for all of our participants, make sure that you are registered or logged on to Slido so you can send in your questions. Let me just maximize my screen because uh, the questions are quite small. Uh, Anonymous would like to ask, what would be the best way to identify or contact the organizations of PWDs at field level to involve them in some interventions or participative activities? I think the question is for me, so I'm going to answer. Um, thank you for this question. So um, actually, um, it's, it's a very important point how we can uh, access people with disability at field level. The best way is uh, either to, to connect with local authorities who might be in touch with some organization at local level or to contact the National uh, Federation of People with Disability who for sure might have uh, either some organization at field level or some contacts over there that could help. Uh, I need also to underline that it's important also to ensure that uh, for full participation, that all requirements are here, such as if you want to, um, to invite some people with hearing impairment, for example, to ensure that you have a, a, an interpreter with you um, or to, to ensure that the place is accessible for wheelchairs, for example. I hope I answer well the question. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Mabrut. Uh, the next question is, where can solar tech packs be purchased for Metro Manila? Hi, Adam, I think this is for me. <laughs> um, you can always contact our office, um, the Institute for Climate and Sustainable Cities um, at info at ICSU.NGO. Um, our office is just here in um, um, Quezon City, so we can reach out. You can look into our website for, for, for this. Thank you. Maraming salamat. Thank you, Danica. And finally, this is for the IFRC. Uh, were you able to capture indigenous practices in the publication to support climate change and disaster? Thank you for that question, Adam. Yes, so we were able to capture their um, local practices in our report. In fact, the photos that you've seen of the indigenous uh, persons in, in the report are from the Matigsalug Manobo tribe. Um, who were affected by Typhoon Vinta. And um, a lot of the good practices, well, of course, they have a higher risk in terms of climate um, crises because they live in the ancestral domains that they live in are one of the are among the at-risk areas um, that are frequently affected by typhoons. And they have good practices in terms of um, housing, land, and property. So for example, um, whenever they need, um, some of their communities need to move to a safer uh, place, they have their own process um, in terms of consulting with their council of elders where they can be resettled. Um, this is, of course, covered uh, not just through their customary practices, but also through our uh, the IPRA Act, the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act, which protects the rights of Indigenous communities who are um, at risk of disasters and need to be uh, and need to evacuate or move elsewhere. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Pauline. And uh, thank you to all of our participants for your questions and of course to our panelists for your presentations and those additional insights. We will now take a short break and we will be showing a series of videos with some key messages and activities for our partners. Why do we race? To win? For the rush? To be the best? To achieve the impossible? Right now we are in a race we can't afford to lose. A race for our planet. A race for our lives. A race for our future. A race for the world's most vulnerable people. In a race against the climate crisis. 
We can't leave anyone behind. Let's race for something even bigger. Let's race together. Let's race for each other. This is the most important race of our lives. Will you race with us? The latest IPPC report is a red alert for humanity and a wake-up call for action. The impact of climate events already causing havoc across the planet and are all but certain to get worse in the coming years. A new research by the World Bank estimates that climate change will push 132 million people into extreme poverty. This means more farmers and fisher folks will lose, will lose their livelihood due to drought, water scarcity, flooding and unpredictable weather and depleting fish stocks. More families than ever will be pushed into un unemployment and poverty. This is further compounded by the pandemic. The hard and bleak truth is that disasters do not discriminate, but they ripple strongest among the poor. But through the compounded challenges of the pandemic, poverty and climate change, immediate recovery can also lay the ground for the community's sustainable development. For UNDP, recovery from disasters can and should advance long-term resilience by informing efforts by worsening threats of climate change and social injustice, both from the, both from the foreseeable future and the long-term horizon, we have better chances to withstand what is to come. This new brand of resilience requires addressing the nuanced needs of marginalized stakeholders, taking them with us every step of the way and empowering individuals to reach the aspirations. Leaving no one behind is a key principle the United Nations stand for and it's the moral compass that guides our work. Faced with a pandemic, a warming planet, and a crippling social inequities, we will continue to ensure that we lay the groundwork for sustainable development in the humanitarian response work. World Humanitarian Day is a very important day for us to note and work towards the long-term resilience. At the front lines of the climate crisis are smallholder farmers, fisher folk, and agri-food value chain workers who tirelessly work to feed and nourish everyone despite of the challenges. Combining humanitarian assistance and development actions, FAO works with national governments, other UN agencies and stakeholders to increase the resilience of households, communities and institutions to enable them to more effectively mitigate and cope with climate threats that impact agriculture, food security, and nutrition. In the Philippines, we help strengthen climate information services for the agriculture and fisheries sector. We support the government to anticipate shocks through early warning systems to safeguard agricultural livelihoods. We design shock responsive social protection schemes adapted to agricultural beneficiaries. We help restore and rehabilitate agriculture and fisheries-based livelihoods to reduce prolonged dependency on aid. We support nature-positive solutions to conserve agriculture, forest, and marine resources and lands landscapes. And we assist the government in transforming policies and plans to mainstream climate change considerations and raise the country's ambition for the nationally determined contributions. In this race against the climate crisis, we endeavor not to leave our farmers and fishers behind. Let us work together for a prosperous, sustainable, and resilient future for all. As a humanitarian donor, ECRO is active in the Philippines supporting humanitarian agencies in saving lives and reducing the suffering of most vulnerable population in humanitarian crisis. The ones we are saving are usually those in precarious situations due to climate change, such as those in the coastal communities, landslide areas and degraded forest land and small islands. 
As most of them are also affected by armed conflict, their resilience and capacity to cope are very low. The humanitarian impact of such complex situation increases due to climate change. ECHO recognizes the need to integrate preparedness and prevention and disaster risk reduction into our humanitarian response. We believe that environment-friendly humanitarian actions can bring greater impact to the improvement of the situation of the people and their long-term resilience to face every crisis. Thank you. For families living in the Philippines who are forced to flee their homes because of armed conflict, climate change is a risk multiplier. It further strains their fragile living conditions and already limited solutions. The forcibly displaced are most vulnerable to hazards like flash floods, typhoons, and earthquakes. Communities also face wide-ranging impacts on their health and livelihoods with the loss of food, water, land, and other natural resources essential for survival. UNHCR is stepping up its commitment to meet the humanitarian and protection challenges already amplified by the climate emergency and prepare for those to come. Together, we can anticipate risk and work with local communities to increase their resilience to adapt. We can help strengthen preparedness and response, support environmental solutions, and empower displaced families and their host communities to mitigate the impact of climate change. Climate change is not for the distant future. It is here and accelerating fast. We need to act now. All right. Welcome back everyone to the Climate Forum. We are now at the second part of the forum where we will be joined by key stakeholders in discussing the different perspectives on climate action here in the Philippines. Living in the Philippines, we all know that our country is prone to climate hazards. Globally, we are ranked as number nine in the most high-risk countries because of extreme weather events. At least 60% of our country's total land area is exposed to multiple hazards and 74% of the population is susceptible to their impact. In fact, half of the most destructive storms on the planet since 2000 have hit the Philippines. As you learned in the first part of the forum, climate change and disasters affect people with different gender and social identities, identities differently. The inclusion and meaningful participation of persons with disabilities and their respective organizations are also crucial in ensuring that no one is left behind. For forcibly displaced populations, climate change is a risk multiplier. Around 150,000 forcibly displaced individuals in Mindanao are dealing with some of the most severe effects of the climate emergency. This World Humanitarian Day, we need to remember that in the race against the climate crisis, we can't leave anyone behind. So in this part of the forum, we will be hearing from our esteemed panel of speakers about what their organizations are doing to ensure that everyone is included in this race. I have the pleasure of introducing our esteemed panel. We are joined by Philippine Disaster Resilience Foundation, or PDRF, represented by its president, Mr. Rene Butch Meili. Hey, Atom. Thanks for having me. Thank you, sir. We also have International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, IFRC, represented by the Acting Global Climate Change Coordinator, Ms. Elaine Angeles. Hi, everyone. Hi, Elaine. From Oxfam Philippines, we have Humanitarian Portfolio Manager, Ms. Roda Avila. Magandang hapon. Magandang hapon. Now from Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines, or YACAP, represented by its international spokesperson, Ms. Mitzi Janelle Tan. Hello, Pa. Hi, Mitzi. And now from the World Food, uh, World Food Program, or WFP Philippines, uh, our, their representative is the Program Policy Officer, Mr. Mark Cervantes. Hi, everyone. Hi, Mark. All right, so our forum will be guided by three main questions and each of our panelists will be given the chance to share the amazing work 
that their organizations are doing. We also remind our participants that you can send in your questions via Slido while the presentations are ongoing. So, ako po yung magtatanong, I'll ask the questions and uh, I'll let you know the order in which you are expected to answer. Uh, para lang everything goes smoothly. The first question is, what are the ways in which each of you can contribute to greener and more efficient climate actions and how will these actions impact the most vulnerable people? Let's start with PDRF, followed by IFRC, then Oxfam, Yakup, and WFP. PDRF, please take it away. Thanks, Adam. I was at a, an international climate forum just a couple of months ago with a politician and he made the point that if he campaigned on a platform of climate change, he would get no votes and would certainly lose the election. So I think it's important for everyone to sound the alarms. No? We have to raise awareness and connect the dots for the people and everyone involved. Why do we have more violent storms? Why is there more flooding? Why are these storms more frequent? Why are there more droughts? And if we can connect the dots so that people understand that climate change underlies many of these different uh, phenomenons, I think they'll understand. And that goes for everybody in society. So I think that's important. And just speaking uh, personally for PDRF, we have a number of programs that address climate change. The Marikina Watershed Initiative was started soon after Typhoon Ondoy Swamp Manila, and we were established in 2009. And we've been busy uh, reforesting that area uh, as much as we can with the different companies. The, another of our initiatives is mangrove planting with the support of Shell. This helps prevent storm surges as well as providing food for the fish and it helps uh, fishermen as well. And uh, a third and fourth of our uh, initiatives is the Safe Water Challenge in which we've invited various groups and individuals to submit disaster-related innovations. And our last initiative is trying to build resilience in terms of business continuity for businesses and communities as well. So we, we think that's important to prepare people for the worst. Thanks very much, Adam. Thank you so much, Sir Butch. Uh, let's go to IFRC. Thank you, Adam. So this question really puts emphasis on two critical needs that we are seeing globally. Now. So first is, the need for significant investment in, in adaptation and resilience. So basically we need funding and we need this funding to reach the most vulnerable. The second critical need is, is drastic steps to, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, meaning we need to change the way we, we do things. And so we have a number of initiatives at IFRC, but one concrete example uh, of how the humanitarian sector is addressing this need that I will highlight today is the Climate and Environment Charter for Humanitarian Organizations. So this is a simple, accessible set of commitments which represent our intent to adapt our ways of working and work collectively as a sector to address the climate and environmental crises. So just a bit of background, IFRC together with the International Committee of the Red Cross or ICRC, jointly led the development of this charter with the support of an advisory committee of climate and environment experts. And we've consulted over 200 humanitarians, over 150 humanitarian organizations. So this was extensively consulted since mid 2020, including organizations based in the Philippines. So the objective of the charter um, in, in it, first commitment is to step up our response and help people adapt, help communities understand risks, um, support local actors, anticipate long and short-term impacts of climate change, and really move quickly to address the growing humanitarian needs. The second commitment is to do good without doing harm to the environment. So this covers the mitigation aspect of the work, really maximizing our environmental sustainability and rapidly reducing our footprint. So this is the next five commitments focus on how to achieve this ambition from embracing local leadership, leveraging our influence, building knowledge, nurturing collective action. So just coming back to the two critical needs I noted earlier, we aspire that this charter would translate to concrete actions to transform the sector and urgently reduce our emissions. 
and also to really double our efforts to help the communities and groups that are experiencing the impacts of the crisis right now. Hopefully that this initiative as a sector collectively would really bring um, more attention to what, are, what is needed on the ground. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, let's go to Oxfam. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Atom. Uh, allow me to cite one example we recently initiated to support uh, climate vulnerable rice farmers in Bicol affected by Super Typhoon Raleigh. Oxfam Philippines and its partner organizations implement solar and other sustainable solutions for its humanitarian projects to help limit global warming and contribute to greener and more efficient uh, climate actions. Like the rest of uh, Bicol region, the province of Camarines has suffered an extensive damage when it comes to uh, the production of their agricultural products. Uh, almost 340 million worth of high volume crops were uh, damaged in Bicol, including Camarines Sur. And Typhoon Raleigh came at the worst possible time. It was the rice harvest season to help the farmers in their immediate needs and support uh, fast livelihood recovery, Oxfam and our partner Rice Watch Action Network or R1 provided uh, solar bubble dryers, organic soil enhancers and vegetable seedlings to affected rice farmers in the municipalities of Panaman, Milaor, Magarao and Kamalikan in Camarin Sur. Traditionally, farmers dry their palay under the sun, but with the continued rainfall and flooding, it it was impossible to do this. To begin with, the sun drying process was not the most efficient since rice grain is continuously lost to spillage and animals. It was also time consuming with the farmers having to collect and store the grains at night or when it rains. To address this problem of drying the palai, our joint response provided four solar bubble dryers developed by the International Rice Research Institute the Hohenheim University in Germany and Grain Pro. The solar bubble dryer has a drying tunnel that collects heat from the sun through the tunnel's transparent top. Because the dryer uses the power of the sun, it does not produce carbon emissions. The trap hot air and the blower enables faster drying and provides a buffer for the temperature and protects the palai from overheating. In addition to protecting the palai from animals, insects, contamination, and rain, the dryer also prevents losses due, uh, due to spillage or cars running over the palai, which are traditionally spread to dry on roads. The dryer can easily be safely set up by one or two persons or even elderly can set that up. The easy setup enables quick preparation even before a projected typhoon landfall. The response also gave out organically produced rice seeds from farmers from Irisin and the distribution of uh, organic soil enhancers or Bokashi. With farmers still flooded after the typhoon and response provided the farmers vegetable seedlings that could be immediately harvested in a month's time. Also established were two hydroponics vegetable seedling nurseries which allows growing vegetables in a shorter period of time within the limited space. Those who receive assistance can easily harvest the vegetables for household use and can sell them within the community. This initiative is just one example. For other humanitarian actions implemented by Oxfam and its partners, supporting families affected by cyclical armed conflict in Mindanao, we continue to use the, and promote the use of renewable energy and sustainable solutions for displaced families affected by new and projected crises. In the interest of time, uh, for other examples, you may also visit Oxfam Filipinos uh, Facebook page for the series of examples on how we integrate renewable energy solutions in our humanitarian and anticipatory action intervention. Thank you so much. Over to you. Thank you so much, Rada. And let's now go to Yakap Mitzi. 
Hi, everyone. So in Yakup, a lot of our work revolves around raising climate awareness, such as um, Sir Butch mentioned. It's something that's so important today. Um, and we do this through various means, such as when we are doing relief operations for urban poor communities, fisher folk and farmers, we don't just give them relief, but we also talk to them and learn from them because there's so much to learn from our most marginalized sectors of society and from our environmental defenders. Right now, we are also developing climate modules, which are built in the context of the communities, because, for example, in my education for climate change, we are talking about melting ice caps and polar bears, which are all very important, but did not talk about how the typhoons you are already experiencing here in the Philippines is a symptom of the climate crisis. So it's so important that the climate education that we have and that we strive for is one that's contextualized and empowering. So we're also right now talking to different regional offices of the Department of Education so that aside from the climate modules which we're developing per community, we're also institutionalizing it and empowering more youth with climate education. And the goal of this climate education should always be to amplify the resistance and campaigns of the most vulnerable people, because they're also the ones who are at the front lines of the defense of our environment. But even beyond raising awareness, we are also relentless and uncompromising and hand in hand with the most marginalized communities. We're calling out the fossil fuel industries, the multinational companies and our national government for the injustices and willful ignorance, not focusing on carbon dioxide emission cuts, not focusing on people-centered adaptation, and instead fix this fixation on greed and the lack of political will to go against the foreign multinational companies that are exploiting our natural resources. And this is what's causing the climate crisis. And so we make sure that we call this out and that when we raise about when we raise awareness about the climate crisis, it isn't just about the scientific aspect. It's not just the environmental aspect, but at its core, it's a systemic issue that's impacting humans. And it is also other humans who are in power that is causing this. Thank you so much, Mitzi. Um, let's now go to World Food Program, Mark. Yeah, hello, Atom, hello, everyone. Uh, for World Food Program uh, on the greening part, uh, we are currently working with BARM. You know? So we have this convergence uh, framework wherein we work with uh, different ministries in, in BARM to involve uh, different uh, sectors, you know? uh, especially those who are already decommissioned and would be decommissioned combatants in terms of uh, uh, working on uh, protecting the environment, doing conservation work. Uh, and what WFP is doing here at the same time is to monetize you know, their engagement. So while waiting uh, for example, the trees to grow and reap the benefits, so we are uh, provided cash-based uh, intervention. You know, so this is a good example of uh, looking into uh, climate change uh, mitigation. No? So that's the greening part. Uh, now on, on efficient climate action. So World Food Program is, I think, one of the pioneering organization in the Philippines who uh, implemented the forecast-based financing. No? So we call it anticipatory action now. now uh, in 20, 2015, uh, World Food Program, uh, together with the German uh, Red Cross, implemented for, uh, forecast-based financing. And we've uh, supported 10 uh, local government units, uh, well, at the provincial level in terms of developing uh, standard operating procedures. And World Food Program uh, wanted, you know, to really mainstream anticipatory action, you know, in the Philippines at the policy level. And that's why currently we're working closely with government uh, agencies, for example, uh, NDRIMC, uh, DSWD, ALG through the technical working group. You know, currently, uh, the FBFAA uh, uh, technical working group uh, has been mainstreamed you know, in the disaster preparedness pillar of uh, the National DRM Council. So in this uh, working group, we have other organizations uh, like a Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, German Red Cross and START Network. So we wanted to really mainstream, you know, AA, not just a pilot uh, initiative, but uh, this is something that LGUs can, can adopt, you know, can implement as a climate uh, action. So why do we implement AA? So AA is a combination of, you know, scientific uh, early warning, 
at the same time uh, action so through uh, forecast uh, models we identify areas that are exposed to climate shocks and we identify uh, at risk families and we design uh, interventions you know uh, before for example a category 4 or typhoon uh, will hit these areas so we develop uh, aa uh, in advance uh, like uh, cash based intervention we provide uh, different modalities you know maybe people can use cash uh, to uh, do early harvesting if applicable uh, maybe do livestock evacuation uh, do you know house strengthening and uh, food uh, uh, provisioning no or maybe micro insurance so uh, this uh, already supports uh, vulnerable families like three days before you know an event so that uh, they will be uh, resilient and once they go to the evacu evacuation center so they already have you know a preposition uh, intervention in place so aa also bridge development and humanitarian uh, work you know so with aa so we reduce uh, the humanitarian cost so this is what world food program is currently doing in in the philippines over to you adam thank you maraming salamat mark um thank you and um we'll move on to our next question for for everyone uh what are the main challenges to be more effective in preparing for disasters in complex scenarios um, let's follow the same order, so I'll call on Sir Butch again from PDRF. Thanks, Atom. Last year, I was in uh, uh, for after Typhoon Rolly slammed in there together with the UN and a number of private companies. Uh, then we were deployed in Tukurau, uh, in toward the end of last year, again with the UN and some private companies to help out and distribute relief goods. So at the time, there were no vaccines. So the problem uh, with these uh, responses is the heightened risk to responders. Earlier this year, uh, our teams went into Taal to help out there as well. The, there's, sometimes there can be a reluctance on the part of uh, some, some of the staff because they have comorbidities or because they're, to be honest, they're scared to be out there uh, deployed but I really have to commend the PTRF teams because they've been out there helping out despite the risks. We've also um, managed to rely on local NGOs more and local chambers of commerce to help out. The other thing I've observed is there's a growing donor exhaustion because in March of April of 2020, we mounted a 1.7 billion peso effort to distribute grocery gift certificates to 14 million people in the Metro Manila area. Soon after that, we raised another 100 million pesos to provide PPEs and ventilators to healthcare frontliners and hospitals. So there's a, people are tired, companies are a bit tired. This has been going now, it's a prolonged crisis. And at the same time, we've had to fight a couple of fires at the same time, no? but we're still in there. And we have a lot of faith in, um, in our teams and all the NGOs here with us in the local um, in the international communities. And uh, we just have to see this, this through to the end. And we're confident we'll, we'll, we'll be okay at the end of this. Thanks, uh, Adam. Thank you, Sir Butch. Um, Elaine? Thank you, Adam. I think I will just highlight three main challenges that we are seeing. Um, and this connects very well to what Sir Butch has, has mentioned. So one is the lack of understanding of risk. Um, we need to be fully aware of exactly how complex the so-called complex scenarios are. What are the risks across time scales, short term, long term? Who are the impacted and really just how vulnerable they are considering their, their socioeconomic status, mental and physical health? Are they displaced, marginalized, etc.? So really understanding the, the different risks um, and how these are overlapping and, and connected to each other. The second one is funding. So on climate globally, there's a hundred billion climate finance commitment, which needs to be met. But not only that, we need to ensure that this enables local actors to design and implement appropriate actions to adapt, prepare for, and respond to disasters. 
The third one um, is we still have siloed approaches. So we need to be better at coordinating among ourselves, integrating our approaches, understanding that the bottom line, the measure of success of our work always is how are the communities better or worse in, in, in cases um, because of our actions. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, Roda. Thank you, Atom. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, indeed every year the country experiences almost all forms of disasters and poor communities in hazard prone areas in the country are hit disproportionately hard by disasters through loss of lives, suffering, and economic fallback. Investing in disaster risk reduction and preparedness yields multiple benefits, starting with saving lives minimizing economic losses and reducing infrastructure damage. Unfortunately, although capacity uh, critically uh, needed for a disaster prone country like the Philippines, disaster preparedness that focuses on prevention, anticipation, and local capacities development for better and quicker future anticipatory responses is woefully underfunded. Climate change will continue to make our humanitarian work increasingly hard, unpredictable, and complex, affecting more people and requiring more resources than in previous decades. Responding to this challenge, Oxfam, with support from the Dutch Relief Alliance and the European Civil Protection Humanitarian Aid Operations, or ECHO, we work with partners on anticipatory actions for floods and tropical cyclones. We use impact-based forecasting, identified triggers, disbursed cash through financial platforms when these triggers were met. We have activated preemptive cash transfers, enabling families to make informed and resource decisions before hazard strike. As we need to further strengthen and expand these approaches, there is a need to continue working with climate scientists and science-based agencies to help improve our ability to project seasonal climate outlooks on the most vulnerable, to institutionalize anticipatory actions and make it more sustainable, policy and infrastructure barriers must be addressed, including digitalizing typhoon data, better connectivity for local government units, especially in hazard-prone communities and local governments being able to use their DRRM funds for anticipatory action. There's also the critical role of social preparation and local leadership involving communities and building local government capacity such that they can lead and sustain the process. Borrowing the words of our country director, Lot Felisco, the success of anticipatory action as an innovation will be marked by how it is scaled out, scaled up, and scaled deep, or by its reach and policy and behavioral impacts. Achieving this will, of course, take time and thus our sustained collective investment is critically needed. Thank you. Over to you, Atom. Thank you, Roda. Uh, now, Mitzi. It, it's hard for me to pick main challenges because of how intersectional everything is and how interconnected all the challenges are. But some of the challenges that I see at its root is really how the country has one of the most climate policies in the world, but the implementation is not great. There isn't enough support for our departments. There isn't enough support for our plans. Um, there needs to be more focus on, as someone mentioned earlier, adaptation that's people-centered. Our evacuation centers aren't built to be evacuation centers. They're schools and gyms and churches, which will also flood because they're not built to be evacuation centers. Our early warning device systems aren't early enough. Um, some cities are doing better than others because they have more support and they're richer cities, but the cities that are um, more economically marginalized are once again left behind. So we're seeing this pattern in this system of those who are more economically marginalized are always left behind. 
And there needs to be a special focus, especially on the most economically marginalized. We're seeing how, although we claim to have so many plans and to care about the environment, we're seeing projects where instead of rehabilitating Manila Bay with um, mangroves, as our scientists have um, recommended, we're seeing white dolomite sand, which doesn't help the environment, the mental health of our Filipinos or anything. And really, the question here is, why are we doing these projects? Are they to actually help the people in the environment or is there another reason behind it? And I think that's one of the main challenges for us to be able to prepare for these disasters is that there is no actual preparation for them. They're all just band-aid solutions. When there were typhoons last year, the first time that we saw our national government was when they were giving out relief operations with their faces on it on media. Where were they before the typhoon, knowing that they were coming? Why were there dams releasing water in the middle of the night when they knew that the typhoons were coming? We know that we're a, a country that's so prone to flooding. Where is the preparation for that? And then on another side of that, we're seeing that environmental defenders and activists who are calling for adaptation the protection of our environment aren't not just listened to, but they're ignored, silenced, and even killed, making the Philippines the second most dangerous country in the world for environmental defenders. So it really brings that question of, when you ask main challenges of more effective preparation for disasters, it's really, is there even preparation in the first place? That's the first challenge that we need to look at. Is the preparation that's being built actually for the people who are most impacted. That's one of the main challenges that we have. We're seeing that the system that we have here in the Philippines and globally is a system that prioritizes people who have privilege, that prioritizes profit. And that is the main challenge of our preparation. Thank you so much, Mitzi. Um, over to Mark. Okay, thank you, Atom. Uh, I'll start off by saying that coordination is aid. Okay. Uh, and, uh, well, the first step in any disaster response uh, is not food, no? it's not transport, it's not medicine, it is coordination. Okay, and the uh, World Food Program has invested a lot, you know, in terms of research development and tools uh, needed uh, for effective coordination. Okay, uh, in times when uh, traditional modes of communications are down, uh, as we see happening in most recent uh, crisis. Meaning, meaning in uh, ordinary times, you know, the ability of, uh, of communities, you know, LGUs to communicate has been already uh, challenged, you know? but in times of disasters, uh, extreme weather events, uh, fast and effective coordination and communication you know, to save lives uh, uh, still remains a, a big, big challenge. So without robust uh, communication system to facilitate uh, effective and efficient coordination, uh, saving lives, saving lives in advance, you know, will be difficult. No, I mean, this I think one of the points which she was was pointing out. Uh, World Food Program being uh, one uh, of the global lead you know, agency in terms of emergency telco uh, cluster, uh, which responds to emergencies across the globe uh, in providing ICT. Uh, voice and data communications uh, service and coordination actually partnered uh, with with the government no with the Philippine government especially with the department of uh, information and communications technology or the ICT uh, in terms of uh, what we call now the government emergency communications system or jex so it's an existing system uh, we're in uh, part of that is what we call the Mobile Operations Vehicles for Emergency or MOVE uh, at the same time. Now, in, in May 2021, uh, uh, the ICT and World Food Program uh, jointly sent off, uh, for example, six mobile operation vehicles or the MOVE you know, to emergency hotspots in the Philippines. Uh, and, you know, this is complementing, you know, the, the phase one of our project on on Jex. In addition, uh, World Food Program also partnered with uh, Sir Butch Meli, no, with PDRF. So we work uh, closely with the PDRF uh, in terms of a sharing warehouse. You know, once you know, emergency crisis strikes the Philippines, so you know, uh, PDRF and World Food Program works closely uh, on this area. 
We also have a, a strong partnership with the Department of Social Welfare and Development, DWD, uh, on emergency preparedness and response at the same time. So, uh, Atom, uh, this means that when commercial uh, telecommunications are down, uh, as in most major crises or disasters, coordination among responders in the local, uh, provincial, and even national government response clusters will be supported no, uh, through a temporary but re re reliable structure. And this is what uh, WFP and the ICT is currently doing. Over. Thank you, Mark. Uh, that's really important coordination during these, uh, you know, these moments where um, normally uh, our normal modes of, of communicating with each other uh, is down. I would like to just invite the audience before we move on to my last question as a moderator to please send in your questions. Uh, I have a few of them and we will be inviting our panelists uh, to answer after this last one from me, from the moderator. Uh, I'll move on to our third question, which is how did the COVID-19 pandemic change the organization's way of responding to the climate crisis? Let's start with uh, Sir Butch again. Thanks. And thanks, Mark, for the shout out on the Arab Joint Programs. I was wearing your t-shirt this morning, actually. <laughs> but, um, well, uh, start out on a personal note. Uh, my mother passed away from COVID uh, two weeks ago. So that brought home to me personally uh, the high cost of this pandemic. And uh, so I really urge everybody to get uh, vaccinated and to protect yourselves. The, uh, speaking for PDRF, there's a huge digital shift in the way we do business. And the, we launched a platform called iAdapt. And uh, it's a platform for teaching business continuity, family preparedness, disaster preparedness, and it's actually uh, gained uh, many more uh, followers because of the Zoom link, it's much easier. And we used to go around the country teaching these courses. So we stopped doing that and we launched this platform. We also launched a number of digital tools. One is called CCAP, ccap.com.ph. It's a free resource. I'd urge everybody to uh, sign in on it. It's designed to help small businesses recover from the pandemic. You can access loans, and there's all, also online mentoring advice, as well as uh, all kinds of games to help you on your resilience journey. We have a comic book that you can download there as well at seekup.com.ph, and a lot of nice pictures uh, teach you about resilience. We have a mobile app. It's called Katatagan in a Box with the uh, UPS Foundation. Again, that's uh, downloadable. We have the MSME guidebook. We also have a public service continuity guidebook. All of these tools are designed to help build resilience and preparedness for both the private sector and the government. So uh, they're free. So please uh, take a look at them. And uh, I think it will be helpful in the future as we uh, go through this uh, COVID journey. So there's been a big change in the way we've done business. There are a number of startups as well who we work with. They aim, some startup companies aim to digitalize small businesses. They help them sell their wares on Amazon. They help them export their goods. And uh, you can order online groceries, the way we consume entertainment. So really an old world is, is dying uh, in front of us and new worlds being born with a lot of uh, uh, the younger generation very much involved. So that's um, it's changed the way we do business and but we're continuing to reach out and help people. Thanks, Atom. Thank you, Butch. Uh, let's go to Elaine. Thank you, Atom. So I think it's fair to say that COVID made humanitarian operations anywhere more challenging. So we see how there were disruptions in travel, markets, supply chains because of lockdowns. But at the same time, it exposed gaps in our systems. No? So we also see a domino effect of health, social, and economic fallout. So this was particularly difficult because we also see that the most vulnerable and, and those with the least adaptive capacity are the ones who suffer most from the combined impacts of climate change and COVID. So just to paint a quick picture of that, in, in 2020, IFRC 
found um, in a study that there were uh, 132 extreme weather events that occurred and, and at least 51 million people worldwide have been affected by different um, hazards, floods, droughts, storms. Further, 2.3 million people have been affected by major wildfires. 437 million people in vulnerable groups have been exposed to extreme heat. And of course, we are all familiar with how this has affected us in the Philippines as well. So all this while dealing with the direct health impact of COVID or while we're struggling to cope with lockdown and control measures. So in terms of our work, we needed to adapt quickly, become more agile, become more creative in our approaches. We continued our regular programming, as, as you can see the Philippine Red Cross um, in the Philippines, you know, continued their disaster risk reduction, disaster preparedness initiatives, um, as well as other initiatives. But, but there were a lot of adjustments to the new reality. So for example, social distancing and in evacuation centers, in distribution centers. There were also um, continued work on extensive risk communication, community engagement, increasing our efforts to help communities better understand the extreme climate and weather-related risks, for example, through training. So we did a lot of the trainings as well, knowing that there are overlapping um, vulnerabilities, overlapping risks. And so it would be really great to understand you know, how these are all affecting us. But this also re-emphasized the need to scale anticipatory action. And as we have heard from the others earlier, IFRC, together with WSP, FAO, START Network, and, and OCHA are part of the task force leading on this initiative. Um, so yeah, so these are just some of the ways where our work has changed, but indeed it has become more challenging. And I think it will continue to become more challenging also with the increased um, changes and variability of, of climate. Over. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, over to Oxfam. Yes, uh, Atom, how did uh, COVID-19 pandemic change Oxfam's way of uh, responding to climate change? COVID-19 has thrown uh, the rest of us into lockdown and taken a tremendous toll on the health, social, and economic status of vulnerable communities, households, and individuals. In response to this pandemic, Oxfam and partners have adopted and innovated to continue to deliver life-saving assistance after, even after the harsh impact of climate change. When the cases of COVID-19 steadily increase in many communities in the country, Oxfam with our partner, People's Disaster Risk Reduction Network, quickly adopted our anticipatory projects with preemptive cash transfer intervention to strengthen disaster preparedness of communities, even within the context of a pandemic. Both of these projects use electronic prepaid cards to deliver humanitarian cash directly to households prior to a disaster. These cards distributed to program participants, which can be used for a cashless transaction at the nearest accredited community stores bank ATMs, and remittance centers with debit point of sales. Additionally, cardholders can transact online to purchase basic goods and commodities, pay utility bills, and transfer or receive money through their mobile wallets linked to their prepaid cards. Due to strict quarantine regulations imposed by government, community gathering and face-to-face -face activities were restricted. Thus, digital cash transfer and levering on the power of digital financial platform for aid delivery becomes an essential and effective approach for humanitarian actors as this can be managed remotely and in real time. While this is not new to Oxfam, this strategy has been employed since 2014 and has gone through several adjustments and fine tuning. The digital cash transfer gained recognition as a viable approach as it becomes a safe, quick, transparent, and dignified way to save lives and uh, at the same time proven scalable model in strengthening disaster preparedness of communities, even in the context of the pandemic. Digital Cash offered an opportunity for Oxfam and partner local government units to deliver safe, efficient, and accountable cash transfer assistance without the need to organize face-to-face -face distribution. Moreover, 
Oxfam partners were able to co-develop and adopt context-specific fast transfer safety protocols for COVID-19 to ensure that overall anticipatory actions and disaster preparedness activities could be safely delivered and comply with local and national regulation in the context of the pandemic. Overall, we revise our cash dis disbursement protocols. We increase the number of our financial service providers and organize small merchants as money in money out outlets to provide cash withdrawals to project participants and launch information and awareness campaigns to community safe practices to people supported through Oxfam programs, volunteers, partners, and Oxfam staff. We coordinated with partner LGUs and financial service providers, and even MIMOs, in setting up hand washing stations, provision of face masks, and allow the continuous distribution of assistance without increasing the risk of exposure to the virus. We likewise increase the use of multipurpose cash assistance in recognition of the diverse needs of households including the need to access essential items for preventing the spread of COVID. The cash transfer value was also increased to reflect higher prices in the market. At the same time, Oxfam and Partners ensured continuation of all its cash intervention through remote data collection and management for beneficiaries registration alongside the use of digital cash transfer Oxfam and partners also strengthen its work with community-based people's organizations, women's rights groups, and local government units to deliver multipurpose cash transfer to most vulnerable and highly at-risk communities to strong typhoons and flooding to support their ability to safely access food and basic needs through the COVID-19. These approaches aim at ensuring all cash and anticipatory assistance are delivered in ways that improve future response capacities of local responders and strengthen the resilience of crisis affected communities. Oxfam indeed gained lessons from program adoptions in the COVID-19 context on how changes have allowed us to respond better and improve the way we deliver humanitarian responses, not just now, but in new and future threat of climate change. Thank you uh, very much. Over to you, Aton. Thank you, Rhoda. Uh, Mitzi? I think, as Ms. Rhoda mentioned, it was definitely very difficult to transition um, with the COVID pandemic, especially for us in Yakap, um, a lot of our work revolved around going to schools, going from room to room and, and knocking on doors and asking teachers to give us five minutes of their time in order to talk about the climate crisis and invite students to go outside and talk about it after class. Um, it would be, our work used to be going to farmers and fishing communities and, and protests and learning from the environmental defenders and indigenous peoples themselves. And then suddenly everything was online. Um, it went from finding the right platform to work on and knowing how to tap the right audiences so that with everything being online and so fast paced, we had to get more creative and we had to adapt and listen to the scientists and experts, but also listen to you know, what people were afraid of as we called on for a green recovery in the COVID pandemic. Something that really um, we, that we really focused on during the COVID-19 pandemic is also relief operations for fishing communities and farmers who were affected economically by the COVID lockdowns. And something that really helped us to um, adapt to the COVID-19 pandemic and, and campaigning for climate justice is knowing that they're not separate issues. We know that the COVID pandemic started because um, it is a zoonotic uh, disease, which means that it started because of um, urbanization and deforestation. We know that the same issue of vaccine inequity, um, where the global north is hoarding all the vaccines, is the same reason, is the same thing that's happening with the climate crisis, where the global north is emitting too much. It's the same countries that are causing the same problems. And so we demanded for actual concrete plans instead of what we have been seeing during the COVID pandemic, where we saw 
an anti-terror law, shutting down one of our national media agencies, which is which, which we saw the impact of when the typhoons came and people didn't know about the typhoons coming. Um, we saw these fake solutions. We saw these militaristic solutions going back to face shields and lockdowns every single time, but without mass testing, without um, actually consulting our health workers and prioritizing our health workers. So the way that we responded and adapted was remembering that they're not separate issues, that in order to campaign for climate justice, we have to campaign for COVID um, pandemic recovery that's green and sustainable. It was definitely very difficult. We had to get really creative going on TikTok, making songs and dances on TikTok so that we can still reach our youth audience, um, finding ways to create infographics online that aren't overwhelming, but still um, informative. And it was all these webinars also, like this wasn't something that used to happen, but I think something that we can really take forward um, when we not just go back to normal because normal was already very broken, but instead into a future that's actually prioritizing people and planet over profit is something that we have to take away that we have to be able to adapt and to listen to scientists and experts easily. And I think us as humanitarian organizations, we have done that so well listening to scientists, adapting when we need to, but we're not seeing the same thing with our so-called leaders. We're not seeing the same flexibility and, and the speed and urgency of adapting when we're seeing, and this is already with the COVID-19 pandemic being such a, an obvious crisis. What more with the climate crisis, which is a lot more, well, it's pretty obvious here, but it's a, there's also that slow onset. Will we see the same kind of response where we'll see military, um, a militaristic response to the climate crisis as it gets worse? Will we see the same response where um, instead of focusing on what actually needs to happen and listening to scientists, we'll be getting some strange new laws about shutting down activists? We have to make sure that when we're campaigning for the COVID-19 pandemic and the green recovery, it's still, again, with humans at its center. Thank you, Mitzi. Uh, well said. Uh, let's go to Mark. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Atom. Maybe, Roda, in the next cash in targeting group meeting, let's do TikTok. No? <laughs> we haven't tried that, actually. So that's an input, uh, Mitzi. But, you know, uh, seriously, uh, the current pandemic uh, and maybe future pandemic will not stop all of us, no? Uh, you know, including World Food Program, you know, in providing the, the, the need needed support you know, of our government uh, uh, counterparts, uh, local government partners, uh, and of course, you know, the most vulnerable uh, communities impacted by the climate change. That's why during the, the pandemic, all of us shifted you know, to, to have continuity. You know, and I think at the helm of continuity programming, we have uh, a PDRF um, on that and uh you know the the, the meetings are, are going on incessantly you know we we're, we meet uh online uh regularly uh we use digital platform to access information uh coordination wise i think uh, we almost talk uh, every day you know uh, just to you know find solutions uh, to talk about about approaches uh, alignment um, and and all this uh, precisely because this is uh, uh, the way forward, no, uh, we have to have continuity of, of approach and, and programming. And uh, for World Food Program, uh, our inspiration is, you know, working with the, the most vulnerable uh, people uh, globally and in the Philippines as well. Uh, climate shocks, COVID-19, and even conflict, you know, will will not hinder uh, World Food Program to achieve its mission in terms of saving lives and, and changing lives. That's why the country office immediately shifted no? uh, you know, from uh, doing a lot of face-to-face -face, uh, engagement to uh, remote uh, uh, engagement and blended uh, approach. Uh, for example, in uh, our anticipatory action no? uh, uh, with, with SURF, we're in, of course, IFRC, uh, Start Network is our strategic partner uh, on that project, and you know, Oxfam is also heavily involved in the cash, you know, uh, programming. Uh, of course, PDRF is also involved uh, with that as well. We uh, continued our work 
you know, in, in surf anticipata reactions, meaning uh, we find ways, you know, uh, so we work with the local organizations uh, following uh, the, the localization agenda, you know, of the World uh, Humanitarian Summit. You know, so World Food Program uh, partnered with a local uh, uh, NGO uh, to, uh, to, to do the coordination work at the, at the ground. You know, ensuring that activities are are con, con, continually uh, being implemented, so that when you know an extreme weather event you know will hit uh, the targeted area, so we we can provide the needed uh, uh, actions you know uh, before. So this you know has been has been done uh, in, uh, intensively in World Food Program. So we also look into our well-being. No? Uh, we also look into our wellness. So uh, WFP organized, you know, it's a well wellness well-being unit. So we, I think, most of you as well here in in the webinar also have, you know, your wellness well-being groups. You know, actually uh, on Monday we'll have uh, uh, a webinar on uh, work-life balance. No, so it's very important that we have to take care of the carriers. And who are this? So it's all of us, no? So while all of us is in the front line, uh, providing support, uh, developmental or humanitarian response, we have to take care of ourselves. I think it's a primordial uh, responsibility of the organization uh, to uh, prioritize uh, wellness and well-being of, of staff. And what the program is, uh, prioritizing that uh, at the same time. So uh, in short, uh, while we are facing a lot of uh, challenges, you know, in, in COVID-19, which, you know, this might be a permanent pandemic, we, of course, uh, adapted quickly. You know? We ensure that uh, we have continuity of operations. So... Uh, again, um, good luck, you know, and once a climate crisis is or climate weather events uh, is uh, going to, to happen, uh, rest assured that we have what we call continuity of operations. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, you mentioned the permanent pandemic, but <laughs> I mean, hopefully uh, this will be resolved soon, but you have to be prepared for the worst. Uh, thank you so much to all of our panelists for sharing everything that your organizations are doing to help make sure that we are leaving no one behind and to answer this global challenge for climate action in solidarity with the people who need it the most. Uh, we have a couple of questions from our audience. And at this point, I would also like to invite the rest of our panel uh, to join us if you would like to answer these questions. So we have um, I'm Jessica, just uh, uh, you can be with us. Also, uh, Ms. Pauline, Ms. Marie Catherine, and uh, Danica. Um, perhaps, okay, so it's, it's already projected on the screen. I will begin with a question from Bruce of ABS-CBN News. With, uh, with the Philippines among the most vulnerable countries to the crisis or to the climate crisis, how can the country gain enough capital or funds to better invest in sustainable programs. I would um, give everyone uh, who would like to answer an opportunity to address Bruce. Well, uh, I guess uh, one way is to tap the private sector and the capital markets, because there are a lot more social investors now in, in the world, and they're looking for uh, things to invest in that are both uh, profitable, but also socially good. And there are these huge funds now when they pull the money together. So really good issue, uh, climate bonds. I think there've been a number of these already done and we could give, perhaps use that money to help the LGUs and the um, other uh, officials here uh, work on climate change and the NGOs as well. So I think that's one way to do it, but um, Certainly, uh, the pandemic has tapped uh, a lot of the money out in the system. I, I agree with uh, Mitzi that the response to the 
pandemic globally does not bode well for the response to climate change globally because um, there's been a lot of hoarding on the part of uh, just about every country. And um, so really self-interest is, is quite evident, but hopefully for climate change, we can all pool our resources together. Uh, Atom, may I respond to the question as well? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. So um, earlier, you know, in the Turbo Talk, I, I did share that, uh, one, if we're looking at it from the perspective of um, uh, climate, uh, climate change, then uh, we as a vulnerable country should really call on accountability from those who are responsible for historical emissions and call for climate financing uh, in the face of climate change challenges. But secondly, uh, at the country level, recently you've heard news about um, how our own government resources, you know, uh, may need to be managed better, you know, so that they contribute to sustainable development goals. Uh, in light of that, I would want to point out that next year, um, there will be full devolution and the application of the Mandana ruling, which means our local government units will have more resources in their hands, you know, to to uh, serve the interests and the, the mandates given to them under RA 7160 and all the other uh, um, uh, mandates given to them, including the mandate from RA 10121 and RA 10174, which are the DRM law and the climate change law. Having said that, you know we need to be able to help our local governments uh, be able to uh, really have evidence-informed uh, decision-making around how they will use those funds uh, in our development program. So I think I, I'll end there. Thank you. And also you, just, Ms. oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Ms. Jessica. Um, could you please just, uh, if you may, raise your hand digitally so I can uh, see if you want to answer the question. Uh, Mitzi, go ahead, please. I'd also just like to add to what Ms. Jessica mentioned about the climate financing of the Global North countries. A lot of... Um, messaging around climate finance or loss and damages is that this is solidarity of the global north to the global south. Um, Boris Johnson in the last G7 meeting actually said those lines, but that takes away, as Ms. Jessica mentioned, the accountability of these groups. They're not solidarity. These are reparations. These are This is a climate debt that they have to us for causing the, the climate crisis. And we have to remember that one concrete way to demand for this is the 100 billion US dollar um, quote unquote solidarity fund that they pledged from 2018 that until now they have not been able to um, give. So that's something that's really concrete that we can demand for. And as Ms. Jessica also mentioned in terms of reallocating funds and using funds properly, there's also seeing that, you know, again, I go back to that white dolomite sand beach where those funds could have been reallocated and used properly for something else. We're seeing that there's so much big funding for departments that historically red tag activists when those funds could be used for public services, for bettering education, which will in the end also help us with the climate crisis, for bettering, again, um, our evacuation centers and our response to pandemics and crises. So it's really about making sure that we demand accountability and funds from the people who have, from the countries who have historically caused the climate crisis, but also making sure that when the funds get here, they're used properly, not for band-aid solutions, not to just sit in a bank not being used, but to actually be used for the people and um, to protect the planet. Thank you, Mitzi. Uh, Danica? Thank you, Adam. Um, this is in addition to Ms. Jack's um, remarks on local utilization of funds, especially with the devolution um, happening. Currently, um, all the local governments are in transition for the devolution. It's going to be set for next year. But then um, another, another policy is that um, the local governments will soon be um, um, uh, mandated to climate tag their annual investment plans. So it entails also identifying, um, looking at their annual investment plans or their, or their internal revenue allotment that should be um, allocated for climate finance. So it's again a balance of the planning process for climate adaptation and mitigation initiatives and the balance of um, identifying what should be um, tagged as a climate finance source for the local revenues. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I shall now go to our next question. Uh, okay, I'll look for it in the chat group. 
Okay, from an anonymous uh, participant, could you please share your experiences on how to empower communities, especially at uh, risk people, including persons with disabilities? I think I'll address this to uh, Ms. Mabrut. Thank you very much. Thank you for this question. Uh, so actually during the presentation, I raised uh, the approach we have. So the twin track approach, which is based on supporting, I mean, supporting the participation of people with disabilities in the activities. And on the other hand, um, uh, supporting them to participate. So we we reach and our objective is a meaningful participation. And to ensure this meaningful participation is not only to invite people to, for example, uh, participate to consultative uh, activities, but to provide them the skills and the knowledge to be able to bring their voice during these participative activities. So this is the way we work. And mostly we uh, identify at local level some organization of people with disabilities and based on the situation and the needs, uh, we, we develop some support. So mainly it's the way we work. I think there were also a question on how we support their participation in the preparedness plan. So this is the same, this is the same approach. Uh, so we support them to contribute uh, to this, uh, to the preparedness plan, and we support them on their knowledge to uh, be able to fully participate to these consultative activities. Thank you, Marie. Um, our next question is, um, from Jasper Nukum. How do you think the national government or any good natured entities can help out or assist in providing technical support or capacitating the local personnel or the LGUs? Is there a pragmatic approach to work with the LGUs, especially at this time to ensure that the additional funds would be used efficiently? Um, Ms. Jessica. Um, I'd like to respond to that because it's a mandate given to um, uh, uh, state colleges and universities. And as you may well know, uh, in the current rationalized planning system of, of uh, the government, um, there, we we're required to do climate and disaster risk assessment as a baseline, an evidence-based uh, process for all our, our, our planning you know, and, and budgeting in, in the country. And um, having said that, you know, from from experience, uh, there, there already is a consensus that um, many LGUs are challenged. And, but we have uh, state universities and colleges you know, and um, uh, other uh, academic and scientific institutions who have the capacity to help LGUs. You know, and and, and so, um, so we call on them in the name of public service you know, and extension service to, to do that. Um, the, the process of budgeting and planning is very technical. And if you review it, it's not going to be very easy for, for LGUs. And that's why they will need uh, technical expertise to do that. So in the name of partnership, we call on the inclusion of um, academic and scientific institutions in this process. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jessica. Sir Butch. Yeah, we've got the program with the support of the, actually with the New Zealand government, and the whole idea is to work with LGUs and local health workers so that we can train them, empower them to respond to different crises, be prepared for disasters, and also be prepared for the COVID uh, pandemic. So it's worked really well. We've targeted five uh, different LGUs, and we continue to do this. We're helping now with the vaccination efforts in, in those particular areas as well. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, another question. Uh, this is addressed to the IFRC. To what extent uh, does climate change affect DRR in health, especially in the grassroots level? What practical plans, programs, and activities do you have to address it? Uh, thanks, Atom. Um, so obviously uh, from the discussion today and, and from other um, reports that we've seen in the past few weeks because of this code red uh, on the climate emergency, you've seen that the climate, climate change in itself exacerbates a lot of vulnerabilities. And so um, not just vector-borne diseases, but for example, other kinds of infectious diseases, um, when it hits climate um, at-risk communities where health infrastructures and other services are not so strong, um, it really takes a toll on the affected communities. 
And therefore, a lot of the work that we do in IFRC in, and with our Red Cross and Red Crescent National Societies is to capacitate um, communities and other um, local stakeholders in terms of providing these health and welfare services. But in terms of strengthening, for example, national frameworks on dealing with um, risk, for example, uh, climate risk or disaster, and of course, it is related to disaster risk, um, we actually um, launched just recently a report on law and public health emergencies to see how um, the COVID-19 pandemic has um, interacted with our mechanisms on disaster risk management. And we've seen that um, a lot of the resources that were used to deal with, uh, with the pandemic, so resources and mechanisms, were also the same ones that we have been using for disaster risk management. And so this means that um, in the long run, we have to understand you know, the standards that we are using to deal with health crises. You know, what are the, um, how do we prepare for them instead of, just, uh, instead of what's happening now where we're just merely responding? How do we prepare for them knowing that there are other risks that are present, such as the risk of climate change and climate-related hazards? And we also have to be cognizant of the safeguard mechanisms. For example, in for example, what we have now is a state of exception. You know, we are under a state of national emergency because of the pandemic. And sometimes um, the rights and responsibilities, both of people and government, are um, not so clear. And so um, the way that we deal with um, the effect of climate change, the effect of um, climate-related hazards, and their interaction with health are really within this framework of a human rights-based approach and a focus on preparedness work. Um, so that's what we're doing now. And um, I will share with the uh, participants a link to this report um, on law and public health emergency preparedness and response. So hopefully um, you guys will be able to read it and check it out. And uh, feel free to reach out to IFRC and Philippine Red Cross for more information on this. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, to our speakers, could you please turn on your camera so we can see you? Uh, I would like to call on Ms. Uh, Jessica to also answer this question on uh, the effect of the crisis uh, on DRR, especially on health. Um, I, Atom, I, I requested that I be able to respond to that question because okay. um, I'm from Ililo City and you, you have heard about what has happened in Ililo City and how it was placed on top of the, the ECQ list. You know? But Technically, when uh, the, the city was actually preparing its climate and disaster risk assessment plan to inform the clue, it actually considered uh, COVID-19 and social vulner vulnerability. And there was an attempt really to, uh, you know, to encourage localization of health protocols at the community level, you know, to, to, um, in the name of anticipatory action um, in COVID. But because it is... Um, uh, uh, the center of the the, the region and uh, the influx, you know, of um, of uh, uh, cases were directed to a, a highly urbanized city like like Iloilo. Its hospitals have been overwhelmed. So very recently, you've also heard in the news that there was an attempt, you know, to uh, re-examine the social vulnerability analysis and map out a vaccination analysis and. Uh, a strategy, you know, um, also in the name of anticipatory action, you know, to highlight really where the most vulnerable cases are and where uh, exactly um, will vaccination be needed. So, so that uh, they came out with a, a vaccination prioritization plan. I'm, I'm seeing this as an example because that is exactly, you know, how we can uh, appear, uh, we can utilize anticipatory action, uh, informing. Uh, plans and strategies for DRR health that factors in climate change, you know, in this, in, in this context. And uh, uh, there is a mandate within our laws, within our policies, um, uh, laws uh, relevant to climate change and laws relevant to DRR as well as RA7160 that our governments, local governments and, and um, stakeholders can, can use. You know? So um, uh, this initiative, by the way, uh, uh, is in collaboration. It's a product of a transdisciplinary um, partnership between the National Resilience Council, the local governments, as well as uh, uh, universities like Ateneo de Manila uh, and uh, the University of the Philippines in the Visayas, along with other stakeholders. So thank you. All right. Uh, Elaine, would you like to add something to that? 
Yes, thank you, Adam. Um, just quickly to add to what Pauline has already mentioned, um, on the link of climate and health, we are also seeing, um, you know, how climate, uh, for example, the incidence of heat waves, you know, is affecting or exacerbating pre-existing health conditions. Um, and so just briefly also to, to highlight that we have released a heat wave guide for cities, um, which contains some actions and, and, and we are working as well on, on several materials and ensuring that um, communities know what are the impacts of heat waves and what can be done to address these. So I put the, the link uh, to the guide uh, in the chat. Thanks. Thank you, Elaine. Mark. Sorry. Yes, quickly uh, on, on DRR and health, uh, just to add to Ms. Jeff, you know, uh, now remember in 2015, we uh, already have the Sendai framework. You know, this supersedes the Yugo framework uh, for action on, on DRR. And on, on that particular uh, Sendai framework, uh, the, the concept definition of risks already included biological hazards, including pandemic. Okay, so meaning uh, because this was a result maybe of countries who have experience in terms of Ebola, Mars, and, and SARS. So as early as 2015, uh, uh, the definition of risk already included a pandemic. And the prior to COVID-19, uh, there are actually two, two reports you know, released. In 2018, uh, there was a, an international report uh, on financing preparedness, which already included uh, pandemic. You know? uh, it says that while we increase our financing on, on other areas of development, on preparedness, we, we have little you know? uh, financing inclusion in terms of uh, uh, pandemic preparedness. Uh, and in 2019, actually, World Health Organization also released a, a global report, you know, a world uh, at risk. And uh, it also mentions uh, on a potential real threat you know, of a pandemic, you know, which uh, can sweep uh, millions of people uh, globally. So what I'm saying is that uh, as early as uh, 2015, uh, the pandemic is already uh, in the radar, no? uh, but I think there was little attention to this as part of you know, early detection, uh, early warning, and uh, anticipation. So I think with, with our experience with the COVID-19, uh, we have to rethink how we uh, do the RM in, in the Philippines. You know? And mainly, I think we have to already incorporate uh, pandemic preparedness and and finally atom just to highlight as well uh, as early as 2013 uh, uh, the late uh, uh, senator you know Miriam uh, defensor Santiago is also from Iloilo uh, also passed a bill you no know, 1573 uh, this is an act strengthening the national awareness and responding to public health emergencies sad to say this was uh, not passed into law uh, and hopefully uh, the DR sector can look into this should have been a significant law uh, which can support support LGUs you know, in uh, pandemic preparedness. So hopefully this can be revived into law. Uh, I think we should have a, a, a bill, a law in the Philippines you know, to really uh, look into pandemic preparedness. I think that's my additional input. Thank you. Mark, while we have you on, uh, there's a question for you. How does the humanitarian response community coordinate with each other during times of typhoon? Okay, so uh, we, we have what we call humanitarian country team. You know? It's composed of UN agencies. We have uh, INGOs, local organizations as, as well. So uh, the HCP coordinates uh, regularly you know, to discuss of course, uh, impending typhoons and even post-crisis. At the government level, so we have the National DRM Council, uh, who of course coordinates all of this. And by the way, HCT, we have OCHA uh, there at the helm. 
uh, and also uh, in the NDRIPC level, we have uh, OCHA, we have new agencies who participates, you know, in all of this coordination mechanism. And you know, at the national and local level, we have uh, strong uh, coordination as well, you know, among LGUs. You know, for example, the Office of Civil Defense is also uh, on top of this. Uh, they have what we call PIDRA, you know, the Pre-Disaster Risk Assessment Atom. No, so. This mechanism also uh, allows local government units to do anticipatory action no? uh, in terms of preparedness and, and all of this. Thank you. All right, I have one more question and um, this is addressed to anyone who would like to answer. Uh, private sector companies are responsible for most of the global emissions and other environmental hazards. How can they implement more sustainable practices to combat the adverse effects of climate change? Well, uh, I guess I'd better uh, take that since PDRF is a private sector uh, group. Uh, the private sector isn't homogeneous and there are different kinds of companies here and everywhere in the world, but a number of companies are transitioning to uh, green energy. And we see that every day because there's enormous amount of pressure both from shareholders and the general public to shift. And many investors, as I mentioned earlier, are only putting their money in companies that do uh, social good and uh, not just uh, earn money. So I think there's a lot of uh, pressure in terms of that. I also think that the private sector is, is the source of uh, not just the problems, but some of the solutions through their use of innovation. A lot of the innovations come from the private sector, including the development of vaccines. There are a number of startups here in the Philippines uh, that we work with, as I mentioned, and their end goal is really uh, to make uh, uh, money out of recycling, to uh, collect the, uh, uh, all the goods and clothes that people are no longer using and turn that into uh, usable material that can then be uh, uh, transition into other kinds of products. So there's a lot of innovation ongoing. And uh, if you visit a group called QBO Innovation Hub, again, it's a free resource, public-private sector partnership with DOST, DTI, and Idea Space Foundation and JP Morgan. I'm also involved in that, but it's QBO Innovation Hub. It's a free space for startups and public, and you'll be surprised at the energy and dynamism of the uh, private sector and the, the young people actually involved in uh, developing new ways of doing things that uh, are just beginning to bear fruit. Thank you, Butch. Anyone else would like to tackle that uh, question? I have another one. If you are more inclined to answer this, this other question, I'll go ahead and shoot it. We still have a bit of time. Um, does your organization, um, has your organization been working with areas within the uh, BR, BARMM or BARM? What were specific interventions done both addressing natural and conflict hazards? So has anyone been working uh, within the BARMM? Yes, Mark? Yeah, uh, World Food Program has a strong presence in, in BARM no, or the Pangsamoro uh, Regional Autonomous Region no, of Mindanao. And uh, we have a strong work as well in terms of anticipatory action and shock responsive uh, social protection. You know, for example, uh, this initiative has been supported by, by ECHO, uh, wherein we incorporate uh, uh, so shock responsive social protection into AA. So currently we are also working with different local organizations, LGUs in terms of you know reviewing and updating uh, their local climate change action plans. And at the country office, we we have different tools in terms of climate change. Uh, for example, uh, we currently work with uh, with CIAT in to develop what we call the climate change food security. Uh, analysis you know it's a it's a livelihood zones map you know which uh, map you know uh, uh, major livelihood zones and sub livelihood zones and we also implement this in in the farm region no? 
So as mentioned earlier, uh, the convergence uh, uh, framework or, or platform, this is where uh, WFP works closely with the different ministries, you know, uh, agriculture, environment, uh, social work, education, you know, to really push, you know, for climate actions, you know, and of course, integrating anticipatory action, you know, like cash base, you know, uh, transfer, like as I mentioned earlier, monetizing you know, their, their effort at, at the same time. So we'll be uh, working uh, a lot, you know, in, in BARM in the next 20 years uh, at the same time. Apart from that, we're also in, in the lookout, you know, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, climate and conflict, uh, linking climate in conflict, you know. Uh, this we have an exploratory talk uh, with uh, CGIR on this and maybe do a research on this atom. We're also leading the discussion on the humanitarian development and peace nexus, you know, HPDN, because uh, primarily before it, it was only, you know, HDN, the humanitarian and development nexus. So now we're incorporating peace you know, because, you know, World Good Program is working a lot on on the peace work uh, as well you know so yeah uh, more on this is uh, involving the the commission and would be the commission combatants you know uh, into the mainstream society uh, involving them on uh, uh, you know climate action uh, development work as well so this is uh, the, you know the, the the work we're doing currently in in Bar over to you Thank you. Um, before I call on Roda, uh, I'd like to share also that the UNHCR is working in BARM, uh, mainly, like we said earlier, because um, climate change is a risk multiplier. So a lot of uh, the communities, displaced communities, we, we empower them, we uh, try to work on durable solutions, it's all, and also to support uh, local communities in, um, in hosting uh, evacuees and other displaced people. Arada, you were going to add something. Yeah, uh, Oxfam is uh, also working uh, alongside uh, BARM communities uh, with displaced uh, families in Maguindanao uh, affected by cyclical uh, armed conflict and also working closely with, in two urban areas in uh, BARM, Marawi City and Cotabato. Uh, helping uh, these two uh, cities in terms of their disaster preparedness. Our anticipatory activities actually uh, are uh, centered on those two provinces and we will be uh, expanding to uh, Kidapawan uh, the next time around. But uh, the aim is actually to support uh, these barn uh, urban areas to be prepared uh, anticipatorily to be uh, equipped with the tools, with the uh, early warning system so that they can uh, act swiftly even before a disaster strikes uh, with uh, preemptive cash and different uh, anticipatory assistance that can be uh, supported to uh, at risk communities, um, uh, uh, flood uh, prone communities in Cotabato, in Marawi, uh, and also in uh, peripheral municipalities in Maguindano. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, BAR needed uh, much support uh, at this time and uh, really different actors are working together to ensure that uh, the newborn government are fully supported in terms of uh, uh, the risk of uh, climate change and also uh, the continuing struggle of the Bangsamoro people in terms of peace building. So Oxfam is uh, uh, continue to work with, uh, with uh, the BARM government and uh, hand in hand with other agencies as we uh, work together uh, to, to battle and prepare for the challenge of climate change. Over Thank you, Roda. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to call on Butch and then uh, Jessica. Yes, just very quickly. We have an office in uh, Marawi. We've been there. Uh, actually, even during the siege, we sent a 60-person medical team from Makati Med uh, to treat the wounded, both the civilians and the, and the soldiers. But uh, 
after the crisis, we, we set up an office there in the provincial capital. We have a team there and we've uh, set up a rural health unit. We've provided water to the uh, displaced uh, communities. We've provided what we call e-schools in a bag, which enables teachers to teach under their classes under a mango tree without uh, internet or power, it's got solar power. So uh, I'll continue to help there. The people there are still living in tents. So it's a, it's a very tough uh, uh, situation. And I really encourage everybody to, to try and lend a hand. We also, our last normal year of existence at the end of 2019, starting October 31st, actually, there were three major earthquakes in the Cotabato region. And uh, we were in there as well, responding to, to, uh, with the relief goods and deploying our teams uh, there as well. It's a, the whole BARM area is uh, in need of a lot of help as the previous speaker mentioned. So encourage everybody to, to help out. Thanks. Thank you, Butch. Uh, Jessica? Uh, thanks, Atong. Um, while organizations like ours, you know, at academic and uh, scientific institutions may not be at the forefront of humanitarian work, but we work very closely with organizations like, like yours no? and, and many else's, you know, to, to inform action. And this takes us uh, around the, the country uh, with um, particularly in areas where there is an interface, you know, between climate and disaster resilience and, 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 and conflict issues. But that, what I would want to highlight here, um, Atom, is that we're forgetting a very important context here, and that is the Philippines is an archipelago, you know, that is highly at risk, you know, to um, the climate change, it's, uh, especially in the light of the IPCC report AR6 and the uh, the recent special report on oceans and the cryosphere, you know, from, from last year. And uh, um, in the name of anticipatory action, we need to begin looking at, you know, these challenges uh, around these areas, you know, because we've been working in, in traditional, um, uh, um, uh, you know, hazard prone areas that we know of, like terrestrial and geophysical. But we forget that there's an interface between all of these. So I, I do hope that in the context of this discussion, uh, we are able to see, you know, the, the interrelationships between the different hazards that are at play, especially in a country like the Philippines, uh, which is an archipelago and with many areas that are, are, are with communities that are still highly exposed and vulnerable to these challenges. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I would like to thank all of our panelists for your very important insights and for enriching our discussion this afternoon. Now, to close today's event, I would like to welcome Ms. Oyun Dendevnorov, the UNICEF representative in the Philippines and the United Nations Philippines resident coordinator and humanitarian coordinator ad interim. Atom, thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Excellent. Thank you very much, Atom. So uh, many of us came to this forum today, World Humanitarian Day, with thoughts about the future increasingly threatened by climate change. Indeed, the impacts of the climate change are very evident, and uh, these include more frequent and more severe rapid onset emergencies. Uh, these phenomena threaten directly or indirectly the full enjoyment of our basic rights, including the right to life, water and sanitation and food, health, housing, and the undermined country's development prospects, including the Philippines. So during this forum, I have been very inspired listening to our panel uh, members, uh, uh, so there are so many ongoing work, uh, including the START network in promoting a participatory and meaningful climate action. By leadership of PDRF in getting the private sector to, uh, to implement more sustainable practices. I'm really sorry to hear Butch uh, from you about the uh, uh, your family situation. And uh, I hear your appeal to all people that we, in this uh, COVID context, we make sure that we get vaccinated. We make sure uh, we protect our family members. We protect our communities. And many of these situations can be compounded by disastrous 
uh, uh, emergencies uh, not related to COVID. So my sincere uh, condolences. So I wanna also continue by saying that IFRC's uh, integrated approach to climate change and disaster risk governance uh, that addresses the vulnerabilities. To me, it was uh, one of the uh, very exciting example. And I also want to uh, really commend the uh, organizations like Humanity and the Inclusion that keep a watchful eye on the people with disabilities. Uh, my sincere appreciation goes to Oxfam, UNFP, WFP, FAO, UNICEF, UNICEF, IOM, OCHA, and many other UN agencies uh, uh, for their dedication to the welfare of women, girls, and most vulnerable people that are caught in humanitarian crisis. Uh, so uh, among many others, uh, uh, they exemplify, uh, exemplify our credo uh, that in our efforts to head off climate change, so that we are leaving no one behind. We talked about the importance of the anticipatory action. Recent experience and practice uh, provide resounding proof that anticipatory action can provide a faster, more cost-efficient, and more dignified humanitarian response uh, ahead of climate hazards assisted by innovations in predictive analytics, risk analysis, and forecasting. Early warning is increasingly translating into timely and effective early action that helps uh, save lives and livelihoods. The UN and humanitarian partners in the Philippines are developing new methods to better support national response efforts. Is a uh, host to the world's first anticipatory action pilot for cyclones at scale. The Philippines is contributing to humanitarian innovation. We are very proud of it. Uh, climate catastrophes uh, uh, constrain development. So any action, however responsive, must promote sustainable development at its end. Governments, non-government agencies, private sector actors, we all must continue working together progressively to meet needs and ensure continuity between preparedness, uh, anticipatory action, response, and recovery. So together with panel members, we would like to conclude this forum uh, with clear, uh, with clear uh, perspective of how humanitarian action can best anticipate and uh, thus mitigate uh, the effect of emergencies caused by climate change on the most vulnerable among us. We must win this race against this common threat to our future. The human race is the race to achieve the future we want. Let's win it together. So in conclusion, also, I want uh, uh, to thank all the panel members and participants for excellent discussion. Atom, thank you for excellent moderation. It's not the first time you are moderating uh, these discussions. Uh, uh, so I really commend your uh, uh, moderation and uh, uh, wishing all a happy World Humanitarian Day. Thank you, Atom. Back to you. Thank you so much, Oyen. It's my pleasure to be here today. Um, on behalf of the United Nations in the Philippines and the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, we thank all of you for your participation in, these, in this year's World Humanitarian Day. To all of our participants, the recording, presentations, and evaluation survey will be shared after this forum. Maraming maraming salamat. I hope that everyone has a good afternoon. Please stay safe. And uh, as one final thing, I would like to ask everyone to switch on their cameras so we can take one last group photo. Wow. I think we need to take two because there are so many. <laughs> okay. Um...
Just a few more seconds waiting for switch on their cameras. Thank you everyone and congratulations. All right, I think we're good to go just um, just a few pages. So um, keep smiling for the next few seconds. Um, one, two, three, smile. And second page. Keep smiling. All right, thank you so much and congratulations everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Maraming salamat sa inyong lahat. Please keep safe and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you, everyone. everyone.